So we're going to study James 3 tonight. I unfortunately was not here for James chapter 1 or James chapter 2, so I don't know how much introduction or background anyone might have done. If they did introduction or background, please consider what I'm going to just talk about um, review. Otherwise, maybe this will be fresh to you, but we're going to talk a little bit about James as the brother of the Lord. Um, we're going to look at a couple places in God's Word where James is mentioned, okay? Um, and just sort of establish that he, his relationship to Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 56. And again, you can go there yourself. You can read it up here, whatever's convenient for you. Um, and when they were come, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Of course, they're talking about Jesus, right? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon? Joseph is Joseph and Simon and Judas. Interesting that he had a brother named Judas. I don't know if you thought about that or not, but he did. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Now, we're not going to touch the way that they said this and what it says about Christ and their attitude toward Christ. However, just look at the fact that Jesus was the oldest of a family of at least four brothers and at least three sisters because it doesn't say his sisters, are they not both with us? It says, are they not all with us? So there's at least three of them. So he's from a family of eight kids, and he's the oldest. So just keep that in mind as we read other scriptures about um, James. And we'll just read through some of these. So James, or sorry, John chapter 2, verse 12. And after this, he went down to Capernaum. He, this is Jesus, and his mother, and his brethren, and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. So his family is actually with him during his ministry, right? John chapter three, ver 7, verses 3 through 5. His brethren therefore said unto him... Now, these are Jesus' brothers talking to him. Just think about this and try to wrap your mind around this, okay? His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Now, what does that say about James, the second oldest? At least at this point in Jesus' ministry, James did not believe Jesus was a Messiah. Just think about that. He grew up with Jesus. He's seen everything about Jesus. And he doesn't believe it. Now, and... Keep that in mind as we read on about James and the role that James plays later as time goes on and, and the turnaround that this represents because he went from, based on this verse, unbelieving. And we'll see later what he does. And it, but in here, the transition happens sometime between, well, John 7, that period of time, and Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So by the time of Acts chapter 1, James is a believer, but at the time of John chapter 7, he wasn't. His brother, not only was he not a believer, they're kind of sarcastic to Jesus. Go show your stuff over there. You don't want to be a secret. Just go over there and show everybody. So they're kind of sarcastic about it. Not only do they not believe, they're kind of flippant about it. But by Acts 1.14, he's a believer, if that's what you want to say. I just wanted to mention, too, 1 Corinthians 15.7. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is actually really important because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes through the resurrection appearances. He just lays them out just in line. Specifically, he was seen of James. There was a specific, apparently, resurrection appearance that's not, to my knowledge, documented in the Gospels. He specifically appears to James. Now, I don't know why, but I know that that was the case. And again, we'll see what James does later. Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. Um, this is when um, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. 
And he says, but other of the apostles saw an unsaved James, the Lord's brother. He's sort of included in the apostles now, based on that verse. He's at, at the very least, he's church leadership, right, by the time of Galatians, which is, Galatians was the earliest church epistle written, but it's probably about mm, mid-40s, something like that, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years after the resurrection. So let's look at Acts chapter 12 now, verse 17. But he, beckoning with them, unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. So James is specifically mentioned, right? This is when Peter gets out of prison, when he's um, in Acts chapter 12, Herod kills uh, James of the 12 apostles, right? Peter is imprisoned. He, Herod's going to kill Peter as well. And that's the record where the angel comes, gets him out of prison, he walks out, he goes over to, and we'll see a little later, I'll mention a little later, he goes over to John Mark's mom's house where they're praying for him, knocks on the door. This is Peter. He's saying, okay, go tell the brethren, but he specifically mentions, go tell James. So James at this point is leadership in the church. Again, remember, we go from John 7, I don't believe in you, Jesus, to Acts 1, I'm praying for this thing to work, right? Continuing in prayer. And then he goes on, now he's church leadership. <clears throat> and he's church leadership enough that he specifically mentioned. Jesus specifically appears to him. Peter says specifically, make sure you tell James. Okay? Acts chapter 15, verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, sa answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. In Acts 15, 19, wherefore my sentence is, uh, that we trouble not them which are among the Jews, which turn to God. Now, Acts 15, you may remember, is the first church council, right? During Paul and Barnabas' ministry in Antioch of Syria. Their people came from Jerusalem, from probably from James, because he was the head of the church, as we see later in Acts chapter 15. People came from there and are teaching, essentially they're saying, to be saved, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to follow the Mosaic law. So they have a dispute with Paul and Barnabas. They decide they're going to go to Jerusalem to hash it out. That's Acts chapter 15, the first church council, right? When everybody says their peace, Paul says their peace, every, Peter speaks, the last one to speak is James. And this is what he says. And in Acts 15, 19, if you're reading this in another translation, when the King James says, wherefore my sentence is, what the Greek says is, therefore I judge. The Greek literally says, therefore I judge. So what he's going to say, he's going to just capsulize the whole thing up, and he's got the final word. So James at this point, at the time of Acts 15, is kind of the head of the church in Jerusalem. He's kind of the head of the church, right? Um, but remember, he came from John chapter 7, I don't believe at all, around to being the head of the church. The reason that I wanted to point that out is that was a huge change for him. There, I don't know if you're another uh, analogous change that I thought about was John Mark. If you remember John Mark, um, the John Mark that wrote the gospel of Mark, right? He's the, the John Mark that in Acts chapter 12, it was his mom's house that Peter comes over and knocks on the door. Rhoda answers the door. She says, Peter's here. <laughs> and what do they tell him? They're praying for him, mind you. They turn to her and they say, you're crazy. He's not there. We're praying for him. He's in prison. But he's at the door, right? That was John Mark's mom's house. John Mark is also the John Mark that went with Paul on the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. He went with them as far as, let's see, uh, they had ministered to Sergius Paulus, and then you may remember the record of Elimus the sorcerer who's stricken with blindness, and then they leave there on their way to Antioch of Pisidia, and John goes back to Jerusalem. He leaves altogether. Right? The same John Mark that in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas want to go on another missionary journey, Paul, Barnabas says, let's take Mark. Paul says, no, nope, not doing that. He left us the first time. I'm not taking him this time. Right? So the dissension is so sharp between them that they split up and Paul and Barnabas don't work together anymore. 
There's no record of them ever working together after that first missionary journey and then the split before the second one. That's that John Mark. But it's the same John Mark that after that wrote the gospel of Mark. It's the same John Mark that after that, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, you know, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you for he's profitable to me for the ministry. So there was that kind of a dramatic change between I'm leaving the missionary field, I can't deal with this, to I wrote a gospel and I'm profitable to the ministry for a guy that's, you know, he, Paul, he, he was the ministry at that point, right? <clears throat> so I don't know how dramatic James' conversion was, if that's what you want to call it. Because, again, John 7, we read, his brethren didn't believe in him. James, his, the next oldest, didn't believe he was Messiah. And yet, by the time of Acts 15, he's the head of the church. His word is pretty much the deal on this. Um, so, I wanted a couple other things. Um, I don't think we probably need to go through that. I mentioned it. Galatians chapter 2.12, we'll just read this. For, for before that certain came from James, James, the James we're talking about, he did eat with the Gentiles, that's Peter. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. <clears throat> and let's just read, if we could, together. Um, and you can turn in whatever you use. Acts chapter uh, 21, 17 to 24. Acts 21. This is... Um, you may remember that um, Paul is really pushing to go to Jerusalem. And in Acts 21, he gets to Jerusalem. And this little interaction that we're going to read about is his um, interaction with James and the apostles. Actually, it's James and the elders. Interestingly, the apostles are mentioned in this record. It says James and the elders. So we'll start in verse 17. Um, does somebody want to read this that has a newer translation? Because I got KJV. Would anybody like to read? Joel, go ahead. Yeah, 21. Now, I wanted to read that, and I'm not making a judgment about James, not at all. But notice that that message was from James and the elders, number one. Number two, they specifically tell Paul, we want you to keep the law. That's a command. That's not an option. They didn't ask him. They said, do this. Okay? This is what we want you to do. Um, that starts the series of events that results in Paul being um, mobbed by the Jews, and then the, so much so that the Roman guard has to grab him away from the mob so they don't kill him. And then they end up, he appeals to Caesar, so he ends up going to Caesarea, and he's in prison there for two years. You know, he appears before Felix and Festus there, and then he appeal, that's where he appeals to Rome, and then he goes to Rome, and it's another, he's another two years there, and that's where the book of Acts ends. So from this time on, he doesn't travel freely to preach God's word until after the book of Acts ends when he apparently goes on another missionary journey. But James and the elders specifically tell him, we don't want them to know that you're not supposed to keep the law, so we want you to keep the law, we want you to do this. Right? That's James and the elders. Point being, James at this point is the head of the church. He's specifically named. Notice the apostles are not named. 
I'm not sure why. I frankly don't know. But it caught my eye that they weren't. Earlier in Acts, you would always see the apostles there. Peter, I mean, you'd always see them present. In Acts 21, you don't. <clears throat> so, um, and then I just wanted to mention 1 Corinthians 9, 5, just by way of sort of keeping in mind other things you read in God's Word and the learning that you can uh, gather from that. Uh, have we not power to lead about a sister or wife as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So, brethren of the Lord, apparently, James was married. Based on this verse, apparently he was married because that's what it says. <clears throat> so, um, so now we'll actually look at James chapter 3, and let's go ahead and read James chapter 3. Would someone else, again with a newer translation, like to read James chapter 3? We'll just read the whole chapter, and we'll go back and look at a couple of things. So that was a little background about James. Okay, that, Up to now, that was also some background about James, the brother of, of Jesus. Now we'll dive into the epistle that he wrote. Anybody want to read? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, James chapter 3. <laughs> James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not not me become teachers, knowing that we shall receive the strength of good. For we all come with many things. If anyone does not come with word, he is perfect, he is a perfect man, able also to provide our whole body. Indeed, we put bits and horses out and say, may obey us. And we turn our whole body. Look also at ships. Also, they are so large and driven the fierce winds that they are turned by a very small road wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little limit and boasts a great thing. See how great a forest, um, see how great a forest, a little fire can be. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it is the whole body. Set on fire the force of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue, and is unruly to eat it, for dead poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the humility. Out of the same mouth which is blessed and cursed. My brethren, these things all not to be so. Does the spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same smoothie? The fig tree, my brethren, bear olive, for great vine bear a fig. Thus, no spring yields but salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding something? Let me show by good conduct that you want to go underneath the wood. If you have bitter in me, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not essential, but it is hurtful, essential, and lying. For where envy, self thinking, and fear, confusion, and every evil, evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality. Thank you. Joel, thanks for reading. I didn't thank you when you read. Um, a lot of this chapter, as you can see, having read it, is about words, what we say and how we say it. We're going we're gonna to talk about the teacher's thing that he first says just by way of... Um, by way of, I think it's important as men because we're essentially teachers whether we really want to be or not. <laughs> um, because you teach your wife, whether verbally or by conduct or just by the way you act and speak. Um, you teach your kids um, whether you want to or not because they're gonna, their little brains are going to absorb something whether you put anything there or not. Um, the best thing to do, of course, is to obey God's word and to do what we're supposed to do, and we'll talk about that. But the fact of the matter is, as men, um, as Christian men, we are teachers whether we want to be teachers or not. And, and hopefully we want to be and we grow in that role, you know, within the context of what we choose to do. But let's talk about James chapter 3, verse 1. In the New American Standard, um, this 
chapter, or this verse says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. The one uh, study tool that I use in the New Testament a lot that I really like is called Robertson's Word Pictures. He is real good with the grammar part of things, the Greek stuff. So for a moment, we're going to get geeky. Um, this command, is this is actually a command. It's in the imperative mood, although it's hard to translate that into English in this particular case. But because it's in the present tense, what it really means is, and he, I noted here, stop becoming many teachers. The fact of the matter is, it was an, a, a phenomenon. It was a movement. Everybody and their brother were trying to teach things that they didn't necessarily understand. So James is saying, okay, wait a minute, hold up. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Okay. Um, and he goes on to explain a little here. There is thus a clear complaint that too many of the Jewish Christians were attempting to teach what they did not clearly comprehend. So this verse is actually talking about Everybody can teach now, and that's not necessarily true. Not that everybody shouldn't have opportunity, not that people cannot grow in that discipline. I don't mean that. But um, what James is saying here is, okay, hold up. Not everybody is going to be teaching doctrine. That's what that verse is talking about. <clears throat> but and interestingly, though, too, um, and again, just by way of reading God's word and sort of noticing details, James considered himself a teacher because he says, we are going to receive a stricter judgment. So he included himself in that group. He himself considered himself a teacher because he says we. <clears throat> and uh, that teachers are a gift ministry. Uh, you may re remember Ephesians 4.11. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, etc. So those, that's a gift ministry. I mean, a, uh, it's, it's a, a high calling, if you will. And then I thought about this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Christian men are teachers, whether you want to be teachers or not. Um, the Shema that Pastor David chose as the theme for the retreat that we had. Um, this is from that, and again, the word Shema just means listen, okay? That's all, that's all that fancy word means. Hebrew word means listen. So listen up, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house, walkest by the way, liest down, rise up. Teach diligently, I think I've mentioned before, is the Hebrew word for sharpen, to wet, like you take a knife and you sharpen it on a sharpening stone. Um, to do that, first of all, just a couple of details about sharpening. Number one, you have to do it over and over again. A knife doesn't stay sharp all the time. You have to do it over and over, number one. Number two, to sharpen a knife, you have to take a little bit of metal off. So what you're rubbing it against is harder than the knife. And that's sort of the way Moms and dads got to be, <laughs> in some respects. <laughs> because sometimes you have to, you just have to stand for God's word. That is the nature of the case. If you didn't want to do that, probably shouldn't have become a parent. Because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, Matthew 12, 35. Um, the thing I thought about with respect to words in general is that they don't start here. They start here. Um, words are... I, I, I mentioned this in the context of Joshua 24. I don't specifically mention or remember the verse I was talking about, but I talked about the importance of words as far as God is concerned. I mean, think about the fact that the only way we know God, at least initially, is words. That is how he chose to reveal himself to us, number one. Number two, your eternal salvation is based on words. If you don't say with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ that he's the Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you're not saved. So words are extremely important to God, extremely important to God. He chose to, and think about the act of creation and how it's recorded biblically. Let there be light. Just think about that for a second, okay? That everything that you see was created in six days because God spoke it into being. Think about that. And how important are words? How important are words now? How important are words in our family? How important is how you speak to your wife or your kids, for heaven's sake? So anyway, a good man out of the good treasure's heart brings forth good things. Evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Words don't start here. They start here. Okay, they start in your heart. <clears throat> good things, good words arise from a good heart. You know, leopard can't change his spots. Now that's not quite true because Romans 12, 2 is true. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But the bottom line is words start from your heart. They start from your heart. 
Uh, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, this is a great verse for this too. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts um, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Um, so most of the time, I think when that verse is used, it's in the context of, of witnessing to other people. You know, going out to like door-to-door -door witnessing or you're doing, we're going to, here in a, a few days, we're going to be doing the gift wrapping thing at Walmart and of course we're going to be talking to people about church and about God's word and about Jesus Christ as their savior. But you know, the first ones you've got to give an answer to are yourself, your wife, your kids. If you don't give an answer to your kids, you know what happens? They live your faith until they can think for themselves and then they don't. When they get to college, they forsake it because it was never theirs in the first place. If they don't make it their own by the time they're adolescents, chances are they're not going to stick to it. So the first people you've got to give an answer to are yourself, your wife, and your kids. Not that this verse isn't, verse isn't applicable to witnessing. I don't mean that. But there are several steps before that in terms of giving every man an answer. Okay. So and again, all this is the context of words and what James 3 says about words. So we're just going to look at some various... Um, verses, Some, most, many of them are from Proverbs, verses about words. And we'll just read a few of these. We'll delve in a little bit deeper to some of them. Proverbs 10, 19, In the multitude of words there wants not sin, but he that refla refrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 17, 27, and 28. These are great verses. These are just great verses. He that hath knowledge spares his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And he that shuts his lips is esteemed a man of understanding, right? So if you're not sure what to say, the best thing to do is be quiet. Because they're going to think you're smart if you're quiet. That's what Proverbs 17, 28 says. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. The point being with several of these verses, control. Um, James talks about um, uh, the tongue and therewith bless we God and therewith curse we men who's made after the similitude of God, right? He talks about the fact that if you can control your words, you can control everything. You just, but controlling speech is a big deal. And we'll look a little more at that. What is supposed to be the nature of how we communicate? Uh, Proverbs 29, 20. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Right? Now we're going to look at that a little closer because this word, and I put these, I put the Hebrew stuff up there just because to the degree that you want to study original languages like Hebrew or Greek, it's not a big deal. It's really not. I mean, reference books and computers nowadays make it a piece of cake. And little Hebrew kids and little Greek kids, they speak Greek and Hebrew. It's not that hard, really. <laughs> it's really not that hard. So I don't want you to think that if you even want to know God's word in that detail, even if you want to study it to that end, it's not a big deal. It's really not. Um, not that you have to do that. I'm not saying that. But if you do decide to do that. So anyway, this word fool, there are a number of different words. You might want to look at this and the Bible sometimes, there are a number of different words in Hebrew for fool, right? This particular one is a kasil, and the root word means to be fat, right? It, which essentially, mentally, is just emphasizing the fact that, that you want to be inactive, that you don't have an active mind, right? That's what this word fool means. A fool is somebody who's willfully, mentally inactive, this particular kind of fool. There are, again, many different kinds of fools in Hebrew. And then one uh, dictionary, I use another reference book I use a lot is a, a book called Wilson's Word Studies. And he cites a guy that uh, defines this verse as obstinate in that on which he has set his heart not to be moved by reason or counsel. In other words, you're stubborn. You're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to say what you're going to say, whether you've been counseled otherwise and it's wise not to do it or not. You're going to do it anyway. That's this kind of fool. So this kind of fool, in this particular case, his characteristic in this verse is he's hasty in his words. Right? He speaks before he engages his brain. 
Okay, ready, let's see, how's that go? Ready, shoot, no, ready, fire, aim, right? So that's this guy, that's this fool. Ready, fire, aim. Speak first, think later. That's Proverbs 29, 20. And that's obviously what we don't want to do. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is fabulous. I encourage you to read it sometime. It's not in a good modern translation. Don't read it in the KJV. It's a little hard to follow. Um, but Ecclesiastes 5.2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. This word rash is the Hebrew word bahal, and it means to be suddenly alarmed or agitated. Right? The reason that caught my eye um, is that in 1 Corinthians 13.5, the passage about um, the love of God, the word agitated, I, one of the words in here, it says that not, uh, love does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. So easily provoked, in this particular case, I will never admit this to D.A., but in this particular case, the King James is not a good translation because there is no word easily in the Greek. They watered it down a little bit because all it says is the love of God is not provoked. Now, the reason I mention that is that's like what Ecclesiastes 5.2, don't be rash, don't be agitated. The love of God is not agitated. Now, that's, uh, for me, that's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, as, as I think back on my Christian life, and parenting, and my being a spouse. I, a lot of times, didn't do that. Just did not do that. Not that it was good, but I just, I was rash. And it's just not a good thing. So, um, and then this word hasty means to be liquid or to flow easily and it, or to hurry, right? It's just like you sort of, water is always going to go the path of least resistance, right? So we don't want to do that in our communication. We don't want to go the path of least resistance. Communication, flat out, is hard work. If, how many times have you said something and the other person didn't understand it? They even maybe repeat it back to you and they didn't understand it. Whether it was a child, you tell them what to do, or and with kids, you might even say, okay, here's what I want you to do. Now, what did I just tell you? Because what you say and what they hear is not the same thing. And it's true for adults as well. What you say and what they hear is not necessarily the same. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, so this is, Ephesians 4.29 is the purpose of communication in a nutshell. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you're communicating with any, with any other reason in mind, purpose in mind, I encourage you to really reconsider because this is the only reason we should communicate. This is the frame of reference, so to speak, from which we should communicate. Right? This is the therewith blessed we God part of James 3. <laughs> and also a little bit in here is the therewith curse we men. Right? So this word corrupt is the Greek word sepros. It means to be rotten or to, or to be putrid. Right? But if you just look at this verse, Paul defines what this, what corrupt means. Instead of being corrupt, what we're supposed to do in contrast to that is what is good for supplying help when there is a need, right? That's, that's his, the first part of his definition of, of what rotten isn't, right? You should supply help when there's a need. And the second part is what does not minister grace, okay? So the opposite of rotten is you're communicating help when there's a need and that you're ministering grace, Right? So that's the opposite of the rotten. So again, the Bible many times is its own dictionary. It defines its own terms. It tells us right here what the purpose of communication is supposed to be. If we're not speaking to the end that we're supplying a need and we're ministering grace, then I encourage you to reconsider. Or at least reconsider how you're doing it. Your tone of voice, the look on your face, um, how quickly you speak, how loudly you speak. All of those things are part of communication. So the life lesson, caution, engage your brain before engaging your mouth, right? Uh, be aware of the impact of your words that your words have on others. And, and uh, also, 
the accountability inherent in giving birth to them. And when I say, I, I thought about, you know, when you speak something into being, you really, when you speak, you can speak something into being. I mean, Romans 10, 9, and 10 is your salvation, guys. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe that God raised him from the dead, you are bringing about, you're doing your part of salvation. Of course, you can't save yourself. I'm not saying that. There has to be, God still has to do 99%, but you have to say that. And when you say something, um, you are sort of giving birth to an idea. You give it, especially with your kids. I mean, you got to think about with children, for example. When you're speaking to them, there is nothing in their brains at all. It's a total blank slate. The only thing they got is what they hear from you and their mom for probably several years. So they're forming ideas. They're forming ideas. I think um, common. I think common. The common statistic or wisdom that I know of is that character, as we think of character, is formed by the time of about five years of age. I'm not saying it doesn't develop beyond that, but substantially, it's formed by that point. So you've got to think, you've got to figure that they're forming their ideas that are going to last their whole lives. I talked to a, I was talking to a patient the other day, and she was sharing with me that um, she had tried, uh, tried to commit suicide two different occasions, right? Because of how her dad treated her. Tried to communicate, or to commit suicide twice. Tried to throw herself in front of a bus. Tried to slit her wrist because of how her dad treated her. So, again, moms and dads are teachers. Whether you want to be or not, you are, right? To each other, of course, and then to your kids because everything in that little brain for the first few years, you're responsible for. <laughs> it's you. Okay, here's, the, I, I've mentioned this before too, brain's considered by scientists, by, I'm not talking about Christian believers, I'm just talking about Joe Average scientist. They consider the human brain the most complicated thing in the universe, right? So here you get a blank one, and they're going to give it to you, and you're responsible for it. Now just think about that. And think about the impact of your words, of how you say it, of what you say, of how often you say it, of the purpose with which you say it. Because again, words arise out of here, not from here. They arise from your heart. So communication starts with intention. You know, what feeling do the words communicate? Is it edifying? Is it supplying help when there's a need? Is it ministering grace? Or is it... And, and I will be honest with you, sometimes mine was the latter. And I'm not proud of that, but it was. So I thought about the effect of words just in a secular sense. I don't know if you're familiar with the Communist Manifesto. Karl, let's see, Marx and Engels, yeah, wrote it in 1848. Um, and the, the numbers are actually down now with the number of people in the world who live in a communist country. But we're just talking about a book they wrote, right? We're just talking about a book that advocated a classless society where all property was held in common and it was against what we in this country called capitalism, right? It was just a book. Now there are still, to, to date, China, 1.3938 billion people, still live in a communist state that arose because of that little book. North Korea also is actually the purest communist state in the world, still. There are three other countries that are still communist, and the numbers were much larger earlier in the 20th century. But even now, 1.4 billion people, because of that little book, live in a communist country, because of the ideas in that little book. And the other one I thought of, um, not a good one, was um, mine. You may be familiar with Hitler. And Hitler was actually a soldier. I didn't know that. I learned that recently. He was actually a soldier and fought bravely in World War I. And then did some stupid stuff back in Germany. And he did a lot of stupid stuff, but stupid stuff before he did the really stupid stuff in World War II. Um, but he was in prison for a while. While he was in prison, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf. In German, that means my struggle. In it is when, where he advocated um, the fact that the Jews were the cause of all ill and that they should be eliminated. 
That's where he started that, in Mein Kampf. So he convinces a whole country that that is true, just with that book and his oratory. He convinces a whole country that they should kill millions of Jews just with that book. And I, for the life of me, outside of devilish influence and, and devil spirit, um, if not possession, certainly, certainly influence. I don't know how you do that outside of that because the Germans were enthusiastic about this. They wanted to do this. But it all started with a book full of words. So think about the, the negative power of words. On the other hand, think about the positive power of words. You know, Jesus Christ, Christ said uh, not one jot or one tittle is not going to be fulfilled. God's word is the ultimate positive word, which is why you know, we study, which is why we memorize, which is why we're supposed to teach our kids that. So I think that's all I had to say, I believe. So I'll close with prayer, and if anybody has any questions. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for the truths that James emphasizes for us of uh, the intention with which we speak, uh, what we say, the purpose for um, our speaking, our communication. And help us all to be better Christians, better men, better husbands, better fathers in the way that we communicate. And we thank you for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.